Today on Rambling About Cars, there's a new Toyota GR86. There's a new Hummer EV SUV. If you're like us, you probably can't afford either. So we're also going to talk about some nice, cool, cheap cars. We're doing a cheap car challenge. We are. And and also, we've got a little teaser for next week's episode. Get ready for Mustang Day. And we've got a special guest uh, who's coming to us from the Ford Performance Group. His name is John Clore. If you're a Mustang guy, you know who he is. We're super excited to have him next week. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, friends, revolutionary road warriors, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way is Chris Bruce. What's up? Not much. I'm happy to get talking. Um, yeah. So last week, we kind of we knew this announcement from Toyota and Subaru was coming. We mm-hmm. didn't know what it was, and we kind of spent a segment talking about what could it be. We, you know, we kind of we knew in all likelihood it was going to be the new '86, but we didn't know for sure because there was all sorts of other stuff that it could be. And so we, you know, we threw about about hypercars and yep. uh, crossovers and stuff like that. And it turns out it was the new 86. It it was the 86. And to be fair uh, for all the listeners who tuned in last week, and by the way, you you really tuned in last week. We had some good numbers last week, so we appreciate you coming along with us. We kind of didn't think it was going to be the 86, if we were honest. I mean, there was there was a lot of of evidence that, okay, yeah, it's probably the 86. But, I mean, there was also a lot of doubt sowed in there, too. Right, right. Like, why, why Subaru is there with Toyota if Toyota is launching their version of the Subaru BRZ. And that's actually kind of what happened. Subaru was there with Toyota when Toyota launched its GR86, which was weird because Toyota wasn't there when Subaru launched the new right. BRZ, which was what always kind of gave us pause that, you know, maybe something's up, maybe not. But anyway, here it is. Um, as you can tell, it looks a whole lot like the new BRZ that's on the way. We don't yet know when the new 86 is coming to the US, so we don't have like pricing data and stuff like that. But um, uh, otherwise, it, they're basically the same vehicle. You can tell there's a slightly different front fascia. The um, Slightly different. Well, the grill is more uh, here. I've got a good side by side image because of all things, Toyota just released this like this isn't us making it. They just released side by side images of both models. Right. You can see the front. The Toyota has the more squarish, rectangular front mm-hmm. fascia, whereas it's more of a trapezoid on the Subaru. The um, Subaru's um, uh, intakes in the corners a lot more angular. They're mm-hmm. a little bit more kind of curvy on the Subaru. Like you can see there are differences, but they're not big differences. It's almost like a two different body kits on vehicles. Like Mm -hmm. it's not anything you're going to write home about. Right. And, and under the hood, they're um, identical. (laughs) Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but power is the same, correct? Between the two. Power is the same. Yes. Okay. Because, and that's noteworthy because I know there are a few news outlets who have been saying now that the Toyota, the 86 has a little bit different. They're actually, they're not confused, but they're quoting the horsepower that's going to be on the JDM version, the Japanese market version. Correct. It's going to be be a little bit different for the U S correct. And that's why I go back and saying that we don't have the U S specs, the U S pricing yet because Toyota of Japan put out all of this information and that was for the Japanese market. And if you look the Japanese market, 86 and the Japanese market, BRZ are identical in terms of, uh, right. uh, horsepower to work, stuff like that. There is zero reason to expect that's going to change in the United States. It's just that emissions regulations vary mm-hmm. region to region. Europe is kind of the most strenuous. Japan is a bit in the middle. The United States is the most lenient. It just, things vary. Right. And you know, um, cause we're looking at this, this is another reason to follow us on YouTube because we have these images up here right now. Um, I got to be honest, I've seen the BRZ, I've seen the 86. This is the first time I'm actually looking at them side by side. I didn't have a chance to actually go through this gallery yet. And I got to say that I remember, was it our first or second podcast where we were talking about um, various cars and I wasn't really enthused with the BRZ. It just looked a little too happy. Yeah, you, I remember I, that. I, I got to say the Toyota looks a little, a little meaner. The Toyota looks, a, you know, it looks, it's, like oh, it wants I, to kind of eat the BRZ a little bit there. I, th- I think that's 
I think that's a little bit putting out of proportion. Basically, the difference is the front fascia. That right. you know, the Subaru, it has that very rectangular look at the front. The BRZ, it's kind of a trapezoid that kind of comes in at a point. Let's be honest. They're essentially the same vehicle. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh they're totally the same vehicle. I'm just, I'm rather astounded. I mean, obviously... The, you can have a, a pretty big difference just by changing the fascia a little bit. Yeah. It's like, it's like the BRZ. You also see the headlights are a bit different too. They are. The BRZ they are. Headlights. I say that. Yep. Yeah. They're a bit different. The, the BRZ kind of has that, uh, that, that evil genius kind of look like that. Sure. Like, yeah. Like it's sitting there going, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and the Toyota, it almost has that kind of surprise look like, Oh my God, are you going to try to kill me? And the BRZ is like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm just totally going off the rails here, I know. Point being, Toyota GR86, Subaru BRZ, they're the same car. And really, Bruce, don't you think it's rather telling that when Subaru launched the BRZ, Toyota was nowhere to be found? I think that's but, interesting. But when, yeah, but when the 86 came out, they were right there with Subaru. And even their teasers leading up said, let's make great cars together. Yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, don't know what that means, and I wish I did. Is you know, I wish I were a more clever guy because I think there's something there, but I don't know what it is. Um, the well, image I mean, you're I, talking about is right here. I mean, on for face value, I mean, is is Toyota sort of saying thank you, Subaru, for giving us a car and letting us put our badge on it? I mean, that, that's kind of a harsh way to look at it, but I mean, is that what we're talking about here? I mean, there's something you have to realize is that Toyota owns, I want to say it's 25% of Subaru now. Is, is it that a, much? It's at least 22. I would okay. need, I, I, I will look it up later on, but I want to say it's 25%. So that's a pretty significant share. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, I mean, yeah, there's definitely partnership going on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. It, it feels like there's something else going on behind the scenes where, oh. Toy where Toyota felt the need to to have Subaru included with this. So we've talked about this in our Slack channel, and this is opinion I hold completely. I think within 10 years, Toyota will own Subaru. Completely full Just on. Just me personally. They already own 22 to 25%. Subaru doesn't hasn't really invested in the EV infrastructure the way that Toyota has. I, I think it's inevitable at some point Toyota is just going to buy them out. And that's that Subaru is going to be Toyota's kind of semi rugged brand. Really? Maybe I'm wrong. That's just my totally my personal opinion. But well, I, I mean, it's it's not a bad opinion. Um, Subaru has has. As such, they're such a dominant force, not necessarily in, in sales, but with their customer base. I mean, they have yeah. a really strong, devoted customer base. And yeah, my wife if, being one of them, she refuses. She <laughs> loves her Outback. And we were talking about it. This like she refuses to get anything other than a new Subaru. Like that's it. That's it. When she and, buy, when it's time, it's a Subaru. And I mean, I wonder how that would change if Toyota just completely absorb Subaru. I mean, we're, we're talking about Subaru still existing to some point. But, yeah. I think it would but be a not, not necessarily. Thing, yeah. You know? Yeah. It has, it has a sub brand type thing. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I rather hope that this partnership still, uh, still leads us to other awesome vehicles like a reborn SVX, which we're going to talk about more. We later, I promise. About, yeah. We're going to talk about that later, but you are correct in that Subaru is woefully behind in the electric market. And they really need Toyota's help on that front. Um, and just super real quick, yeah. I want to share something. So this is something um, Motor One's German edition put together um, where they compared the current um, uh, 86 versus the previous gen. So 2021 versus 2019. And it's amazing just how similar they are in specs. So you're looking at what? Uh, the new one is 25 millimeters longer. Width is identical. identical Height yeah. is the new one is 10 millimeters shorter. Which 10 <laughs> I mean, that's a centimeter. Yeah, like that's, that's, that's the nothing. Wheel base right. is up by five millimeters. Like it, they haven't changed much. Is just kind of what's interesting to me. And 
you know, there, there's obviously there's been talk about Supra and 86 and whether or not Toyota wants to have an 86 that kind of encroaches on the Supra. Um, I, I mean, Bruce, what's your take on the 86 in Toyota's hierarchy here of, of performance? I think they have to have it. I think, you know, performance cars we understand are a niche. Like if yep. you're looking at it in a realistic point, you performance cars, even entry-level performance cars like the 86 are a niche vehicle, but they're also a necessary vehicle because, you know, the people buying an 86 are going to create a lot more passion for the Toyota brand than someone buying a Corolla, right. even though, you know, a high-end Corolla and a low-end 86 are probably the, the exact same price. Um, that, you know, those performance vehicles, whether we're talking about Mustang at Ford or, think, you know, whatever kind of the entry point into performance is for a brand, that is what kind of creates that emotional feeling with a brand because those are the vehicles that someone goes out and they have fun with and that fun kind of enmeshes itself within the vehicle and, you know, it, it all gets meshed up with like good feelings and nostalgia. And then, you know, 30 years later, you have this entry level performance car, but then you finally have a bunch of money and you buy the really expensive performance car. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's a lot of it. So, you know, 86 sales probably aren't going to be huge, but the people that buy them and love them, Toyota are probably going to have forever. Um that's my opinion. Now, here's another question that I'll pose because um, I think you'll agree pretty much everybody at Motor One is kind of in love with the GR Yaris that we're, of course, not getting yeah, in the States. That's a um, but yeah. there's But there's been a lot of talk that there could be a GR Corolla. Mm -hmm. um, and Toyota is as if I remember correctly, is teased that pretty heavily. I don't think they've, I don't think teased it anything, is a bit of a strong they, official. They, yeah, there's nothing official. It's just kind of, they've basically asked the community, the kind of enthusiast community. Is that something that you would like? And of course, everyone's like, yeah, of course we want that because every review of the GR Yaris is just, it, it, it sounds like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Like it's just, it, it just it's relatively inexpensive. It has, you know, the world's most powerful three cylinder engine. It's not, you know, stupidly powerful, but it's everything you could ever want to use on the street. It's kind of rally inspired. Like you just look at everything about that car and you say, I want yes, that. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm totally on board with it. If Toyota does do something with the Corolla similar to the Yaris now, I mean, doesn't doesn't Toyota's kind of bottom end performance area get a little more complicated? I mean, I'm wondering and the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm wondering if Toyota's very clear involvement with Subaru is suggesting that maybe there's going to be some other sort of rally inspired Corolla that could be coming out similar to the Yaris. I, I don't know. There's, I keep coming back to that because it's so, it's so odd to see Toyota and Subaru together there on that 86 reveal when we didn't have any of that collaboration with the BRZ, which is really the same car. I guess what mine, my mind immediately goes to is look at Toyota in the eighties when they knew how to have fun and you had, you know, the Corolla GTS, which we called it in the U S the 80, 86, the Torino from uh, initial D all that same model. You had the MR2, you had the Celica, you had the Supra, like you had this true hierarchy of performance within Toyota and that's kind of gone now. Like, yep. What there's the Corolla Asphalt, which our guys reviewed, and they were like, "This isn't great. This this mm -hmm. isn't really a great performance car." Like Toyota is kind of missing that. They have the '86, they have the Supra, but there's not much in between, you know? Right? No, there's. I mean, there's really nothing in between. Well, you've got uh, you've got like what, I guess you've TRD, got like the, yeah. the TRD versions of the of the Avalon um, and the Camry and the, and the Camry, which I mean, the TRD Camry looks kind of cool. I mean, it's not really much of a performance it's more of a of an appearance thing um and i won't i won't touch on supra really being a bmw i still feel like a lot of hardcore toyota people i, I, I still i still believe they feel that way that's the, yes. and i think they do too it's just that 
but it's what's there. It's what we, yeah. you know. But yeah, I mean, no, you're right. Toyota is still missing a lot of that. So, you know what, Toyota, let's do the let's do the GR Yaris in the U.S. Let's do the '86. Let's do a beefed up version of the '86. Let's do a GR Corolla. Let's do it all. Just, yeah. just come on, you're you're Toyota. What this, no, last year you, can, you were the you largest automaker in the world. Let's throw some money at some stuff and make you, up. You can the do excited. this. You need some more Halo vehicles, right? Yeah. So. But Toyota out of the way, let's talk about something else that debuted. Did it, what, debuted Sunday night or Saturday <laughs> night? So, okay, this is going to be a little inside baseball for people. Because um, I have a little bit of a marketing background. Generally, not a good idea to try to send out press releases or drop your big news on Fridays or holiday and, and, weekends. Yeah. Because, you know, people's attention are, it's elsewhere. And understandably so. Yeah, um, people have lives. Which is exactly why the GMC Hummer EV SUV debuted on Saturday of Easter weekend. It was Saturday. Um, it was it was what, what I think like five o'clock p.m. Eastern time yeah. was when the official debut took place. Um, and and I wrote it up. It's not really anything extraordinary. We knew obviously that this was coming. Mm-hmm. It was, They've been teasing it. It, it was literally it, since the the pickup debuted. They showed right, up. like in, right. in they, silhouette. They, were, they showed they the were, SUV. Right, they were teasing it for a while. Um, they finally introduced it on Friday. Um, let me get the screen up here so everybody can see what we're talking about. It's really just the SUV version of the truck. The, the, if I remember correctly, the wheelbase is a little different. Um, but the interior, the features, all the same. You still have the two motor or the three motor option. Um, the, the three motor not coming until twenty twenty four. Let's not. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's, it's going to be a while. It, it it'll be a long while. And and there and you know asks another question. Are we really debuting vehicles two years now before they become available? Um, the GMC Hummer EV SUV. Does go on sale. I'm going to have to scroll down here and, and, and review this here. Right. The spring of 2023, yeah. the cheapest, but I mean, like the truck, the cheapest one is going to be the two spring motor 2024 and that's spring of 2024. So, I mean, that's three years away. Yeah. That is three years away before you can get the cheapest one at 79, 995, 80 grand. Um, it does have a little less power than the truck. It is, 800 and and 40 horsepower no 830 830 i'm sorry okay 830 the the torque is the same they still list it at 11,500 pound feet of course that's going to be that's not accurate at all well it's here's here's where it's a little here's where where it gets a little tricky let me let me explain this because i've kind of come around a little bit you should Um, have i disagree immediately (laughs) so so when GM is quoting this astronomical figure, that's obviously torque at the wheel. It gets multiplied um, from By the gear ratio at, from the from the engine to the wheels. Right, it's multiplied, right. so it's it's going to be higher in every application. The tricky part is the normal way of measuring torque is at the crankshaft, you know, the engine, which is, I mean, that's the way everybody does it, but. The GMC Hummer doesn't have an engine. It has, in some cases, two electric motors or three electric motors. So it's it's difficult to just say, okay, here's the shaft torque rating because there isn't really a single shaft to talk about in the in this instance. So I kind of understand why they're doing it. It's still misleading, and there's still I still don't see any reason why they can't do a common conversion, which. 11,500 pound feet. We did this a while ago when the, uh, when the truck came out, that's equivalent to about a thousand foot pounds of torque, which is still a crazy impressive number. That's Mm -hmm. pretty much the same that you're going to get from some of your big, um, you know, three quarter, one ton diesel pickup trucks with, with some of their, uh, with some of their big engines. So yeah, this, this came out Saturday of Easter weekend. It's kind of bizarre that it came out that way but i mean we can take a look at some of the photos here so a quick Um, question for you since you covered it and something that kind of surprised me i sort of expected they would cram a third row in just as a selling point maybe it wouldn't be super useful obviously it would take up cargo space but just as a selling point for the suv versus the crossover 
I, I was kind of surprised they didn't cram a third row in it, What do you think about that? You know, I mean, I was a little, just a little bit surprised um, because this vehicle isn't about carrying a bunch of people. It's sure. really, it, it's about image. Um, and in this instance, you're going to have the, the five passenger seating with cargo space in the back. I don't see somebody buying this or not buying this, depending on whether or not there's a third row. I so, agree. My thought was more just as a differentiation point between this and the pickup, because otherwise, essentially, the only difference is that you either have enclosed cargo space or open cargo space. I mean, that's that's really what we're looking at right now. Um, I still think, though, it comes back to image, because when you look at the Hummer pickup truck, it certainly has a callback to the H2, mm -hmm. but I think the SUV really has a callback to the H2. Definitely. Um, I, I think they're I think they're offering this really more to kind of capture more of that original Hummer H2 kind of vibe. Um, and again, we're talking about a six figure luxury electric SUV mm -hmm. um, that will eventually be five figures, but you're gonna have to wait three years to get one. Yeah. Um, it's really about just kind of capturing that old H2 image. And I mean, when I first saw it, I thought, wow, that, that really kind of captures that for me um, much more than it did with the truck, which is kind of, it's kind of weird because really they look, I mean, if you're looking at them head on, you're not going to know if you're looking at the no. truck or the SUV. I mean, it looks like a truck with a bed cap in a certain They way. are. Yeah, they are identical. And I mean, we're looking at a picture of the interior right now. Um, I mean, the, if you're on the view YouTube, you're looking at now of the driver's uh, position in the interior, it's identical to the pickup. You the, wouldn't know the difference. Right. The interior is identical. Um, I mean, it has the same drive modes. Like I said, the power is a little down. Um, I'm trying to remember why that power was down. I, I, if I remember correctly, I think we did an article on it uh, a couple of days ago. Um, engineers were concerned because the, the, the design was a little bit shorter overall. I think they were a little concerned about giving it a thousand horsepower instead of only 840. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how much sense that makes to me, to be honest. Um, I, I still see 840 horsepower getting you into all kinds of trouble. So um, I'm looking at the story right now. And okay. the reason allegedly is that the EV SUVs wheelbase is nine inches shorter than the pickup version. Right. Um, and that means that there are fewer battery packs and modules in, to install. Oh, okay. Good and call. with fewer batteries means fewer electrons flowing into the motor. And so, yeah, so basically it is a power consumption issue. Power consumption. Okay. Thanks for the correction on that, Bruce. Um, but yeah, this came out over the weekend and, you know, I thought it was worth talking about just because yeah, th there's, there's kind of this camp of, okay, what is GM thinking? They're taking these big steps into the electric vehicle realm with six figure SUVs and trucks that are kind of untouchable for the average person. And I mean, yeah, they are, they are. Um, but it's also, it's going to serve as a halo vehicle really as I see it. We've, we've already seen that people aren't afraid to spend five and six figures for specialty SUVs and pickup trucks. Am I right? And I, it, we have, and I think it's also worth taking a holistic view and looking at all of GM rather than just kind of their individual divisions one at a time, because the other thing is that we saw this week is the first pre-production example of the Cadillac Lyric, and that is a year away from entering production. So you're going right. to kind of get this staggered thing where you're going to get the Hummer EV pickup. That's going to be on the first deliveries of those, if I'm not mistaken, is before the end of this year. Yeah. Yep. And then end roughly next spring, you're going to get the Cadillac Lyric, which is, I think, supposed to be a bit less expensive, not significantly, but a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to kind of have this staggered step approach where you're going to have the Hummer models, the Cadillac models, and then we just today found out about the Chevrolet, uh, the Silverado. Um, yep. This, yeah, this, and this is another reason why it's, it's worth mentioning because Chevrolet just announced as we're recording today, confirmed Silverado EV. Yeah. It's going to be built alongside the Hummer, which is right there at their Detroit Hamtramck facility. Yeah. Their, their factory zero 
which they're uh, it's, it's like facility. billions of dollars they're putting into that place. Like that's it, where the EVs a, are going to come from. Right. It's a $2 billion renovation. It's yeah. GM's most comprehensive renovation they've ever done on a facility. Um, so, I mean, give them credit. They're, they're taking some steps. Um, we don't have any details about the Silverado EV. They just announced it. Um, we have nothing as far as a time frame. We have nothing as far as power. We do know GM is planning to build this from the ground up as an electric vehicle. It's obviously going to be using their Altium platform. Mm -hmm. What really stood out to me, though, the in, in a mass of non-information with their with their press release, there was one key bit of information that they're estimating a range of 400 miles. And I say that's key information because we know the Ford F-150 is estimating uh, approximately about a 300 mile range. So with that announcement, I mean, that tells me right off the bat, well, okay, they're clearly targeting Ford. And I mean, of course they're going to target Ford. That's the crosstown rival for, you know, what three quarters of a century. So obviously they're going to be targeting Ford, but I found it very interesting that they, they wanted to include that one bit of information. We're going to be 400 miles versus 300 for the F-150. Yeah. And I, I also think it's worth just reiterating the point that you have to take GM kind of holistically when it comes to EVs, that you have things like the Bolt EUV, you have things like the Silverado EV, you have the Hummer, the SUV, and the pickup truck that... You can't just look at one GM brand and say, oh, they're not doing anything with EVs. Oh, they're not innovating. It's very much a company-wide thing mm -hmm. that is happening through all their brands that is kind of going one step at a time, depending on where you're looking at it. Right. So, I mean, their plan um, is to sell 1 million EVs by 2025. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's a pretty ambitious plan. It's considering, very ambitious plan. I, I, mean, I mean, considering right now they have, what, the Bolt. Uh -huh. I, I mean, technically, that's all they have right now is the bolt, yeah. um, which is a little, I don't know. It, do you ever feel a little tragic that, I mean, we're talking back in the 90s, GM had their EV1. I mean, they were kind of they were kind of first here. So why are they kind of lagging along? Maybe that's why we're seeing $2 billion investments sure. into plants. Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I know there's been a lot of kind of, there's been a lot of negative talk. I'm I'm rather optimistic. I'm very excited to see where GM is going to go with this. Hopefully they stick to their guns um, because so far it sounds good. I would love to show people more of the Silverado teaser. Um, this is it. That, seriously, this is, this is all they gave us was a Silverado badge. Um, if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, yes, there's a play button there. You can play the short video. All it does is it zooms out from the Silverado badge and then the badge turns blue. So, whether it comes 2023, 2024, still up in the air, but the Silverado EV is coming. So, Ram, are you listening? I'm not sure if they are. Well, we hey, know we, a Ford EV is coming. We obviously know a Silverado EV is coming. Stellantis seems, I don't know. We'll see. They're they're doing everything they can with their uh, with their Hellcat engine. Which there, are, they, you know, so, there's the Jeep four by E. So I mean, let's not completely yeah. write them off, but they're not also doing as the, much as the rest. There's also the Rubicon three ninety two, but and, and don't get me wrong, people. I love horsepower. I love loud horsepower as much as the next person. Um, I'm a little concerned that Ram and Dodge uh, they don't seem to be looking too far towards the future. Which give them credit. They're doing good on sales now, but if you can't think ahead a little bit, that could come up to bite them shortly. Yeah. Well, should we move on? Should we, should can we, we can we talk about more SVX? Because I yes. mean, that's, I, I've been waiting for that the whole time. We talked okay. about SVX a little bit last time we did. So we talked la last week, we were talking about the speculation about whatever this Subaru Toyota announcement was going to be. And yeah, it, it bummed us out a little, but during that discussion, we brought up the Subaru SVX and apparently you folks love the Subaru SVX and I can't yes. blame you, Bravo! Um, but uh, we got two letters about that and I want to read them to you. So I'm going to read one. This is from Alan Davidson and um, I will just read what he said. And I do have a few comments along the way. So further to your recent article on MotorOne.com, Carl and I managed the New Zealand Subaru SVX and Vortex owners New Zealand 
Facebook page. So I had to look this up. Um, Vortex is what Subaru called the XT6 and XT Turbo in the New Zealand, Australia market. And mm-hmm. it just got me thinking, that's a much better name than XT6. XT6, or- isn't it though? Yeah. Like, why didn't we get the Vortex? That's a great name. <laughs> We are not as cool. We are so not as cool. Anyway, so they run the Facebook page, which has 323 members with affiliations with other similarly localized groups in Australia and other countries uh, with a worldwide page called SVX Nation. Um, So he lets us know that five and six speed manual swaps are one of the larger upgrades done to improve the car's performance due Mm -hmm. to soft, that's his quotes, transmissions, which in the U.S. markets particularly were prone to overheating. Uh, Brake and coil over suspension upgrades and turbo engine upgrades are also common as well. And that's something we brought up that these cars were famously just famous for just bad transmissions. They only in the U S came with an automatic and that automatic was bad. Um, I currently, this is where it gets interesting. I currently have a supercharger fitted to one of my spare engines. This is a less popular engine upgrade, uh, versus turboing, but improves the download performance. Uh, we have a significant number of overseas membership and an estimate, uh, 50 SVXs in our New Zealand membership. Um, Carl, who is another, he mentioned earlier, is a number of members of this club, is a former Subaru dealer and has had 14 SVXs in his collection in his lifetime. However, due to age and health, he now has about nine, which is <laughs> nine more than that's, I have. That's so, yeah, that's still nine awesome things to have. Yeah. And Alan says, I have three plus a parts car and there are at least I two- called it. <laughs> <laughs> I called it. You don't have one SVX. You no. have at least two. Yeah. So Alan has three plus a parts car and at least two members that we know have have two of them. Um, uh, Mid 2000s, it seemed. Uh, it, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, um, around the mid 2000s, um, SVX ownership in New Zealand kind of kind of grew. And that's the same thing we're seeing in the U S with kind of the rad wood type cars yep. in the United States, that eighties and nineties car culture as guys, our age are getting, have money to spend on them. They're buying the cars that they always wanted. Um, so yeah, he says, feel free to answer us any questions to check out our Facebook page. So thanks, uh, Alan. Alan, I, just, I love I mean, it. Just, I mean, send us cool photos. I want to see the supercharged SVX so bad. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, turbos are cool. The supercharger is definitely going to help you out down low. Bruce, can you imagine either a supercharged or turbocharged SVX with a five or a six, a six speed? That'd be a hell of a ton of fun. I, w- I would be in love with I would never get out of it. I would just put down the weird window. <laughs> yeah. And just and just cruise. And I would enjoy the, the sound of that horizontally opposed engine with the occasional whoosh. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, send us some photos. We were the wine really, from the supercharger on his, in his case. Yeah, we really want to see more of that. But uh, they're not the only people that emailed us. I'll read this email. No, here. we got another um, one. This this comes. I, I won't say his last name uh, for privacy purposes and because I'm not sure I pronounce it right. So Good point. fortunately, uh, we have an email from Ken who says I had past tense, unfortunately. <laughs> A beautiful 92 Subaru SVX, but it was plagued with problems. Subaru never made that big, heavy, or powerful car before. Which is true. So what do you suppose the problem was? <laughs> Transmission failure was a big problem because the oil lines had to run through narrow spaces, and that led to transmission overheating. Brake rotors were too small for the weight, too thin and would warp. Had to be extremely careful just torquing down the lug nuts or you could warp rotors. Now, see, uh, there, that's something I didn't know. I knew about the transmission issues. I didn't realize that the that the rotors were were. Yeah, I had never heard that either. But also, and, if you notice, Alan mentioned brake issues. So, yeah. well, and that and you know, you're not alone. <laughs> coming from the Taurus show camp, uh, I mean, the the shows really throughout their first and second generation had kind of small brakes. Um, the the ninety twos and the ninety threes were especially bad. They actually changed the knuckles in ninety four so they could go with bigger brakes. So <laughs> I'm feeling your pain there for sure. Um, everything was electric: power seats, moonroof, antenna, cassette, CD player with equalizer. Do you remember electric antennas? <laughs> yes, I loved my electric antennas. 
Do, well, do you remember antennas? Because of course cars, don't have, cars don't have antennas like in the, in the traditional sense anymore, right? Yeah, they just have the so, little yeah. shark fin somewhere on the roof. But yeah, well, let, I mean, let me stop us there for a moment uh, because we're talking about an early '90s Subaru that had power seats, power moonroof, power antenna, cassette CD player with equalizer. That was like uncharted freaking territory for Subaru back then. That's what made the SVX so amazing and probably why it was so prone to problems because this was kind of uncharted ground for Subaru. Yeah. Keep um, in mind, the SVX was the first time they installed a six cylinder engine in one yep. of their cars. Like that was, that, that was where that began. So, and, yeah. and it was, I mean, it was expensive for the day too, but mm -hmm. I, but Hey, we're talking about it now. Obviously people are, are passionate about these cars. So Subaru, maybe you're a little ahead of your time, but Hey, you've, you've got a bona fide cult car here. Um, Finish Ken's a yeah, story Ken, though. Cause the Ken, last paragraph is just a it's, tragedy. It's, really, it's, it's yeah. Um, Ken continues to say, I love the car, but it was eating me out of house and home. And after replacing transmission i had it sold luckily i found a guy who had one but his daughter wrecked it and he was looking for another called me up said i'll take it on the phone <laughs> sold it for asking price without even trying to bargain so oh, i Ken. bet you i bet you that guy took the transmission out of the one his daughter wrecked put it in ken's and he probably drove it for a little while until that transmission failed. But still, <laughs> he had a sewer. He had an SVX for a little while. You know, I'm I'm laughing partly because of that story, but also because I had um, a 1990. What was it? 1990? Yeah, it was a 1990 or 91. I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Um, Legacy GT. Yeah. The, the first year you could get the Legacy GT Turbo. Um, and I bought it and I had all kinds of intentions of fixing it up, but it was super, super rusty and I'm trying to work on it and I'm, I'm trying to decide, okay, can I even take this rear subframe <laughs> apart or is, is it, or is it just so rusty? It's just going to go to pieces. And I finally decided, uh, I think it's just too far gone, but I had a similar experience to Ken. I put it up for sale. Um, because I mean that particular engine, the 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 two point two uh, EJ twenty two T, the the closed deck, that engine still to this day is just revered, right? Mm -hmm. So I put it up for sale, and yeah, I had a guy contact me within twenty four hours. I mean, I I think I had it for like fourteen hundred bucks. It's like it runs and drives. Okay, mm -hmm. you can you can probably drive it home. I wouldn't like go hundreds of miles. Um, the shifter's kind of sloppy. There's some slop in the front end, but it's drivable, right? Within 24 hours, I have a message from a guy. Hey, I'm interested in this car. Can I come see it? I'm in Detroit. I was living in mid Michigan at the time. So it was like a two and a half hour drive. I was like, I was like, sure. I um, you know, what are you doing this weekend? He's like, no, can I come right now? <laughs> it's like, it's three in the afternoon. He, he's like, I, I'm like, are you sure you know where I'm at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Come on out. So yeah, he came on out. He got there at about six in the evening with a buddy. Took a quick look at it, didn't even haggle, just paid me the cash, <laughs> drove it home. So, I mean, chalk it up to Subaru. And again, maybe this is why you know, Toyota completely taking over Subaru. Subaru has some really, really strong, passionate fans. And yeah. these these stories here kind of tells it all. Well, that was fun. Okay, sorry. That, that, that was, that was, it was that, a fun that, conversation. Um, no, it, it, oh, it, oh, it totally was. We, we have to move into our second segment now. And yeah, let's, let's talk is, about some more fun. So um, Smith suggested to me the other day in our Slack chat that we do kind of an interesting idea. We find we have a $5,000 budget. We mm -hmm. find one car that we would want to own. One car we would want to borrow, meaning we would have our buddy buy it. He would <laughs> do all the stuff on it. And, and we would just would borrow it. drive it every once in a while. When it works. When it works. And one car we would not recommend either to us or our friend ever to buy. Um, so I, li I like the idea. We kind of we hash things out. So the caveats I kind of added to that is it has to be our, our immediate region. I live in Northwestern <laughs> Ohio, so it's not fair if I find some car in California that, you know, fits everything. So it has to be in a realistic travel distance to us. Realistic the, travel distance. Right. Yeah. No. Is, 
it is a little different in South Dakota. I'm just going to prime it, you. I'll it, prime it, you right now. No, no. And that's fine. Um, and the other thing is we are talking about this specific automobile. So the example I threw out, and this is not one of my cars. It is purely hypothetical. Let's say I find a Nissan 280ZX Turbo, which is a car that I really like. Ooh. But this specific one is covered in rust. It's got rut, rust holes in the body. It's got a rat's, ne a rat's nest in the engine. I can still suggest that as a car. I can't suggest either one of us buying but I can still like that specific vehicle. So anything we're saying here, it's not that we don't like the car in general. It's just that we don't like this specific car. It's um, <clears throat> possible. We don't like the car in general. <laughs> well, no, and that's we, fine. We, too. we might, we might get to that a little bit later. I think I, I'm saying, let me put it this way. These are the caveats I put myself under. Maybe you kind of twisted the rules and whatnot. I'd but. never twist the rules. Okay. Do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Um, you know what? I'll go first. Why not? Okay. Um, so this is now, the car you would buy for $5,000. This is the car I would buy for $5,000. Okay. And I actually, I could buy two for what I found here. Wow. Look at this. So it's a Ford. I didn't see what it was. Oh, it's a Thunderbird. A, a 1984 Ford Thunderbird Turbo a, Coupe. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, $2,500. This is on it, Hemmings. It, it needs a little bit of help. It's okay. It's in Bloomington, Illinois. It's closer to you than it is to me. But like I said, <laughs> I, 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 can, I can get there in it. I can get there in a day. It's a long day. Okay. That's long so, day. so that's so, closer to me than it is to you. It's, <laughs> but it's the, the travel travel distances are a little different in in the world of south dakota also i couldn't find one anywhere and okay. i i absolutely wanted a thunderbird actually i did find um there's an 87 thunderbird down in nebraska which that really would be in my range but it's an automatic and if i'm gonna have one of these i really want the five speed i do like the arrow birds the 87 88 style but i gotta be honest the earlier styles, the, the four eyed styles, um, they're growing on me more and they're a little bit harder to find. Um, I mean, they weren't particularly powerful. They were the turbo coupe. Um, I think the, the 2.3 liter in these was 145 horsepower back in the day, but they're easily you know, tunable though. I, like, I can, yeah, that 2.3, there are still a lot of parts available for the two, yeah. three. It's really not hard to tweak these. I've even seen people that have done, um, eco boost four cylinder, swaps in some of these cars and that would be a lot of fun and at 2500 bucks i i still think that's a good looking car from all I, from all angles um the only other ones that that i could find really were, were some of the arrow birds and mm -hmm. mind you w when we're talking about a regional search okay i stretched mine out to a thousand miles i i, I won't i won't lie i i kind of bent the rules there a little bit but these are getting hard to find, Bruce. Yeah, and, the, and the ones that are left that are in good shape are really starting to go up in value wise in a hurry. So anybody listening or watching, if you're thinking about a Thunderbird, you better act quickly because I think these are only going to be going up in the future, um, especially the Arrow Birds. I mean, I, there, there were a couple that had low miles um, that were like 20 and 30 grand. I don't know if people are actually paying that for them. That seems like a lot. But when I'm searching a thousand miles and I'm only finding like four or five vehicles to choose from, it, it's it's harder to find. And I mean, that's it needs a little bit of help. OK, if, if we look up here at the passenger door panel, things are hanging down a little bit. But you know what? I'll, I'll buy this car for twenty five hundred dollars that for twenty five hundred bucks. Knock, that doesn't bother me that uh, that runs in. I think it runs in drives, doesn't it? Actually, they don't say, does it? It doesn't. The ad doesn't say. So this is not my pick, but it, it was almost my pick. And it's funny that you suggested that this is kind of a, I guess, a sister, a sibling. So a Lincoln Mark seven. So this is Fox body. But this is, this is your pick. No, 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 no. Oh, this is not. Okay. I am just saying like, trust me. I looked around a lot. This was near <laughs> me. It's not fantastic. Like you can kind of see the rest on the hood and stuff, but you know, if the you mark seven, if you don't necessarily, if you don't want a Fox body Mustang, there are some interesting choices out there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was a, that was a Fox body Lincoln. 
Yep. It, it was it was still bigger overall, obviously, than the Mustang. It was bulkier. But uh, I think this was basically the same as the Thunderbird, right? Other than the engine? Or am I wrong? Um, I, I mean, the, underneath, yeah. I mean, the, the Fox platform that was used by the Mustang, that was used by the, the Mark 7, that was used by the Thunderbird. Um, I, I mean, the the interior, the body, I mean, that's a, that's all Lincoln. Yeah. That, that's all Lincoln. Um, and I think, the, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the Lincoln got the high output version of the five liter you could you could you could get you could get the five liter and the thunderbird but it wasn't the high output version which back then i mean it it was like a two and a a quarter it it was it was like a like a 20 horsepower difference between the regular and the and the high output there there wasn't much difference um i I like the i like the thunderbird turbo coupes just because if if i want a fox body v8 i'll just have a mustang you know i'll have i'll have the turbo and just the looks of the turbo coupe were just uh, it just it just had kind of a mean look to it. So a couple of things about this first choice: Facebook Marketplace needs to do a much better job about managing <laughs> prices of cars. It's, it's one thousand two hundred and thirty-four dollars. Yeah, you get a lot of those. So I I mixed all of those options. Yeah. So here is one that I am ninety-nine percent sure is real. And if this is a $5,000 car, then the person buying it is getting a steal. Uh-oh, so we again. have here, hold on, a 2003 Jaguar S-Type R. So that means the supercharged engine, um, 176,000 <laughs> oh miles. I will read the thing. 2003 Jaguar S-Type R, supercharged, 400 horsepower, runs and drives great. Hot heat, cold AC, everything works, 176,000 miles. He has a service history back to new, brand new tires, 4,800 or best offer, and then basically no low ballers. Yeah, I know what I got. Yeah. So my the thing I'm scared about here is this photo appears to be from the fall, judging by the leaves. Mm-hmm. But the thing that I like here is that if you look in the background, the guy owns a GTO, like the a modern GTO. Right. So he's definitely a performance fan. This is not someone who's just like, this is my one nice car. Like, this is a performance fan. And um, let me get the interior image. The interior is immaculate. It's gorgeous. Like, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're looking at a 2003. So it's what? 18 years old, right? You're looking at an 18 year old Jaguar with 176,000 miles. You are. I I mean, I mean, that's why it's 4,800. But, but the thing is, it looks like it has been well-maintained. You get, you get all the original documents. You get the original window sticker. Like, I, you know, it's, oh, it's, I, I won't, I won't argue. It's tempting. I was never a big fan of, of that era jag with it. And the I round, agree with, I, with, the, with the round lights. That's yeah. that the looks like, is that like it the, goes kind of into that retro thing where you get like the Jag Mark two is what it's supposed to look like. It's not fantastic, but for a $4,800 car and our price range was five grand. So with 400 horsepower. Yeah. And if it's, and if it looks that good and, and if it really has been maintained, it's still probably got every bit of that 400 horsepower. That's a yeah. lot of car for the money. I really want to trash it, but I I kind of can't. Um, yeah. How far away? Of, how far away from you is that? Rossford, Ohio. I I want to say it's within forty miles of me. Oh four. Oh my god. I'm um, I'm stretching for like nine hundred miles, and you, you have something what? within forty. In my defense, if I just stuck to like forty miles, I could buy. A Dodge Ram, and I mean Dodge Ram because it's that old, which I actually did a couple years ago because I was just so freaking bored. So I just or, looked it up. or it like is, a minivan. It is twenty point one miles from me according to Google Maps. I think you need to go look at that. <laughs> I think you need to go look at that, and I'm going to apologize because this should probably, as good as this looks, Bruce, and as good as it sounds, this should really be the car that you borrow 
So that's the funny thing. My dad, funnily enough, owns what year is this? Does he say? Oh, three. So my dad owns a 2001 XK8. So it's the same engine, but without the supercharger. And it has been a reliability nightmare for him to the extent mm. that this is the third year that he's owned it and he's about to sell it. But it's still a $4,800 car and we had a $5,000 budget. And I could, I guarantee you, I could drive this thing for a year and still have fun. And after that year, it might cost me $4,800 to put it back on the road. Could, could you I, though? Could you drive it for a year? I think I could. Uh, I think I get 365 days, 366 days. I think I might have an issue. I, I think, I think something, I think something would happen in that one year. Okay. Unless you like drove it home, put it in the garage and like drove it for 20 miles after that. Also, so you're seeing this image I have up now, the driver's yes. size three quarters view. Can you tell what he owns in the back? Is that a Chevy, like a Malibu or something? Oh, uh, yeah, that's it looks like an older Chevy something. I, I can't uh, I can't make it out. Yeah. Uh, so far in the back. This is uh, between the GTO and whatever the Chevy is. And he's got a Ford, I think, pickup. Like this is a guy that I think kind of likes cars. So I why is he? So, so why is he selling it? Why yeah, is he? Selling you're it? right. Because because he knows twenty more miles down the road. You know, to, yeah. to to be to be fair in case just in case the person who owns this car is listening. We honestly we don't know anything about your car. It looks. No, fantastic. I only know what you have I, said I'm about not, it, and it I'm does not, look really nice. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not trying to uh, to uh to down talk it i'm not trying to to dissuade people from buying it um i mean it's 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 the nature of the beast 176,000 mile jag and this is all actually rather interesting and perhaps a little um Fortuitous. spooky spooky um okay. it, it, in the irony department um because i'll move on to my second choice please do which also happens to be a Jag. Uh, okay. <laughs> I exactly. It's a, it's, 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 it's a little bit older. And yes, it's okay. It's not 40 miles away from me. Um, it's more like, what is Milwaukee? About 800. I can, but that that's a day's drive. Yeah. South Dakota speed limits are 80 miles an hour. Um, I can get there easily to Milwaukee in a day's drive. That is a 1988. Jaguar XJS. Sorry, it's a 1988 Jaguar XJS convertible V12. Um, runs and drives. Does he have it's an underhood a, shot? A hundred thousand miles. There is no underhood shot. Um, there are some That's interior scary. shots. Um, the, it needs it needs a new top. Okay, let, let's go through okay. the description here. Whatever. Um, British racing green with tan. Come on, does it get any better? on a V12 Jag than that. No. Um, it's an excellent, modest project. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but, but here's here's the key. The 12-cylinder engine runs well. You can drive it home. Okay. If that's really okay. the case, I, I mean, that's, that's where things get a little dicey. Um, it needs a new top. It needs seat covers. Okay. And the rear quarter windows do not raise. That's okay. That's a bit of an issue. That starts to get more expensive. Yeah. Well, just just don't put them down. Sure. You know, you, you can leave those little wings up there when you put the top down. The wood on the console needs some attention. It looks in okay. General, it's a it's little a very, scratched, but it's not that bad. It's a decent car with very little corrosion on the body. I bought it to make it a driver, but I have too many projects open to realistic offer, but please no bottom feeders. I will respect you and expect you to do the same. It's an 88 XJS. The the seats, uh, yeah. As we're looking here, the seat is that bad. It, it's no, it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Um, the door panel looks good. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, I guess I can see a little bit of issue there with the wood. Um, it's scratched, but it's not. You know, we don't have a really good look of the outside of the car here. I, I, but, but the thing come I on, let's look at the hood ornament right there. Yeah. I need to see the engine because those things are just a nasty mess of spaghetti vacuum hoses. I need to know how bad it is. And the fact that he's not showing us that, oh, he's got a Bentley in the back. <laughs> I know, right? 
<laughs> so this guy's crazy. This poor, this poor guy. <laughs> this guy bought an XJS and a Bentley. So like, I hadn't noticed that before. No wonder he's trying to sell the. J- oh wait, I just noticed those quarter windows are down already. So we'd have to try to get them up or just drive it when it's nice out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, has somebody who drove a convertible that needed a top for the better part of a year? Um, a little bit of tape goes a long way. And when it's and and come on, you're gonna drive this when it's nice. I'm not too keen on those wire wheels. The the, the wire They're wheels. Fine. I mean, it's 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 it has more of an elegant. Like, it's a V12 Jag. I I want it to be a little bit more exciting than that. Um, but this is why this this would be the good borrow car because yeah, because f- I would have to put all the money into repairing it, and then you would get to come over every once in a while and drive it. And so by that point, yeah. And, you know, this would be the perfect car for the friend who knows that V12 very well. Now, here's a little bit of full disclosure. Every week, it seems like I say, oh, I've been on the fence of buying one of these cars for a long time. And, folks, I'm not just saying that. I've owned 34 cars in my lifetime, um, most of which have been under $2,000. So I can be a little bit of a glutton for punishment. This is one of those cars where... I, I would love to have the XJS V12, but I would also need to become an expert on the engine. And I would rather like that. I would like to really get to know that engine, get to know all the issues, get to know how to repair it. That's, I mean, that's how I came to be so involved with Taurus shows because the first one I had, I went to take it to a shop. I popped the hood. They saw the intake. They were like, what did NASA build this thing? It's going to be two grand for me to do any work at all. And I'm like, I'm in college. I don't have two grand. I don't have 20 bucks. So I had to learn about that engine. And once I did, it's like, well, this isn't any big deal at all. I can take the intake off in 15 minutes. And with the intake off, you can reach pretty much anything you want. So there's a big part of me that really wants to do that with the XJS, with the V12. And I know there are other people out there because I've, yes, I've looked at forums. I've looked at Facebook groups. I really have been on the fence about getting a V12 XJS for a long time. But for now, still at least, it would have to be the car that I borrow. Okay. I I respect that. I would, yeah. Yeah. I will take that hit for you and you can borrow it from me. (laughs) Okay. Now let's see if you, so it's weird that we've had a very much a British car kind of thing going on here. Cause I'm going to keep that rolling. Oh, it it stops there for me. I'll be honest. Okay. Well, uh, that's fine. Um, So sadly we have only one photo of this and not much information. Um, but it but is within. You don't want to recommend. Oh no, this is your borrow car. This is my borrow car. This oh, is my borrow oh my, car. oh my God, Bruce! I so was about to climb to through the a... monitor and and choke you out for that one. Okay. Yeah, this is my borrow car. So you your have to car. buy a '77 Triumph Spitfire for forty five hundred dollars. That we only have one photo of that apparently has seventy eight thousand miles on it. Good shape, approximately seventy eight thousand. Approximately, yeah. That's that's because the odometer stopped twenty thousand miles ago. It probably did, yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm know, cool with that. I have a thing for you know MGBs, Triumph TR6s, Spitfire. I, I I like. There's a certain romanticism to that type of thing. I can't really talk that much about it simply because we don't know much about this one. Um, but for the money. You know, I don't necessarily want to own this myself. I'd rather have the that, that S type I showed you earlier, but it it seems like a decent buy. Like if you were a fan, if you wanted an entry point into this, at this point, that's what nice Miatas are going for. Mm-hmm. And if you kind of have that nostalgia spark in you and you want something a little bit different, this fits the bill. You know what? I so want to be just kind of attacking you on these things and damn it you're bringing up some choices that i'm kind of into i wouldn't mind buying that i could get that with like a nice nice tweed sport jacket i mean look at the look at that again sadly we only have the one image the top looks okay you know we i guess we don't know if it runs but it it all seems for forty five hundred dollars that doesn't that seems like an interesting fun car 
you know, it's not something you're going to drive every day, but you know, you get it running for four weeks during the summer every year, and then you <laughs> work on it the for, entire for rest of the year for forty five hundred dollars. There you go. So sorry, yeah. I don't have a big long diatribe about this one, but yeah, no, that, no, that's okay. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind taking that hit for you because okay. so I've, now I've, I've, I've had I've had an eye out. I've never been on the fence of buying a Triumph Spitfire. I can say that much. Sure, but they've always had my attention. I've never smoked a pipe, but I, I would kind of like to if I Tweed had one Jack of those. is smoking a pipe driving the, the, that. Yeah, you look like a college professor circa like 1982. Yeah, that's, you know, there's a part of me that weirdly likes the thought of that, and I really don't know what that means. So we should probably, we should okay. probably move on. Why don't you go first for the car you wouldn't recommend, a.k.a. the car that I would burn. Yes. Buy, so, borrow, right. burn. Right. So I have to be clear here. This is not a car that I dislike. This specific car scares the hell out of me because of everything about it. Um, so we have a 1990 BMW 325i convertible for $3,000. Um, it has... 210,000 miles on it. It has an automatic transmission. And for anyone not watching us on YouTube, it is sitting next to a Chrysler PT Cruiser that is beat the hell up. So whomever is selling this, oh, I'm sorry. There's also one other thing I wanted to point out. We are looking at Facebook Marketplace where it says the cost is $3,000. I'm zooming in. You'll notice the price on the windshield is four thousand nine hundred ninety. Yeah. There's a weird differentiation there. Um, the other th we don't have that many images, sadly. We I think we only have three. So here's the rear view. The top does look decent. Oh, sorry, there are only two images. <laughs> from Wallhead Auto Sales. I, I Maybe I shouldn't say that for legal reasons. Um, from somebody. Uh, from somebody, yeah. We'll fix that in post. Yeah. Um, so it is a 1990 325i convertible with 210,000 miles with an automatic transmission. I love E30s. I, I really do. But I no one should buy this car. <laughs> like... <laughs> This is, I mean, uh, first off, it's a convertible. That means the top is going to break. Secondly, it is a 19, it says it's a 1990, it's a 1980s engineered BMW. That means the automatic transmission is going to break. And like, unless it's already been rebuilt, it's $3,000. It hasn't already been rebuilt. <laughs> If it had already been rebuilt, it would be significantly more than that. Well, it is. It's forty nine ninety. I can see it right on the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this is one of those cases, and I've actually preached this for years. Um, because for a while, the reason I've owned thirty four cars is because for the better part of oh gosh, fifteen years, um, I would just enjoy buying a cheap car, fixing it up a little bit. So I'm I'm pretty handy under the hood. Um, I can't do everything, but I can do a little bit. I'm really handy with paint and body work. Um, so I would buy a cheap car, fix it up a little bit, drive it six to eight months later, sell it, buy another cheap car. And, and I just kind of sustain that way. Um, the only way to really make that work and not lose your hat every single time when you're shopping at kind of this level, the, the lower end of the, of the price spectrum you have to shop the seller as much as the car. And Bruce, I, I think you make a good point here. Um, we're, we're, we're shopping the seller here. We're, we're basing things on the seller. We have a car, uh, just a couple photos, no real information about it, a discrepancy in what we see on the windshield for price versus what's listed in the ad. It's parked next to a car that looks like, it uh, it was used at like a high school, you know, you know beat them up derby demolition, or uh, you know, as an example of why you shouldn't drink and drive. Um, yeah, there's there are there are many questions, and and I mean I, I'm I mean it's it's obviously not a private owner. It doesn't look like, um, or maybe no. it is. You, you you know you know hard to say. I, 
T- highly doubt it. I it still, is. I still don't know if it's if it's burn worthy though. I mean, maybe this, maybe the seller, okay. but so okay. That, if we want to get be, extreme here, call. there was one other one that is legitimately burn worthy. I still select the BMW as my burn worthy, but only because this one is so funny. Would you like to own a Cavalier stock car? Um, it is eight hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> this car is judging by the map. 15 miles from me. So I could be there within 20 minutes at most. Um, It is a completely stripped 1997 Chevy Cavalier. It has a wheel in the passenger seat for unknown reasons, (laughs) but it does have a racing seat. Like you could, if I got to be honest, my stock car, like super, super low class stock car uh, knowledge is not great. I don't know if they have front wheel drive series now, but that appears to be what this is for. It is $850 and she's ready to go. You know, I I see what you're seeing about burn, but I I don't, I don't want to burn that one either. I want to take I, I want to take that to like the the jankiest spectator drag you've ever been to, and and just let it rip and just have some fun. I mean, you that's really what this car is supposed to do. Like, there's no there's no pretending what this car is, which I think is kind of what's beautiful about it. It's she is what she is, and yeah, you know what. Put a license plate on it. Try to drive it down the road. I bet you'd get a lot of looks. I bet if you went to Cars and Coffee and parked that next to the guy with the with the 2009 or 2010 Lamborghini, I bet you would get more looks. I mean, credit to the seller. It has a very nice roll cage in it. You could race this thing for $850 if you want to go racing at the very, you know, if you just want to get started racing, I got to give this guy credit. This looks like a way to do that. It's just so funny to see a Cavalier for me set up that way because Cavaliers are what kind of what every girl in high school drove. So it's funny to see a Cavalier race car to me. But yeah, well, <laughs> on that note, every girl in high school drove that. Bruce, I think you know what's coming next. What did every guy in high school drive? At my high school, a, either a 3000 GT or a um, Dodge Stealth, but I think you're going to go with like an IROC Trans Am. What? Come on, man. You know me and Pontiac Grand Ams. Oh, okay. Yeah. My buddy had one of these. So, so, he wrecked it. so here's a 2004 Pontiac Grand Am. This is up in North Dakota. Honestly, I didn't even have to try. And I, I apologize to anybody who loves the Grand Am. No one loves this generation of Grand Am. <laughs> I mean, this one in particular looks in pretty rough shape. Um, but my desire to burn isn't just related to this car. It's pretty much every Grand Am. They are just yeah. They they, they are the worst thing ever. And I was thinking about this today. Um, and and I could read details on this ad, but it doesn't matter. It's a Grand Am. Burn it. It's 2004. Actually, it's one of the better ones because towards the end of the run, they got rid of all the stupid body cladding on the side. Towards the so, very, very so, end. So that was it, late. It, it's a little bit better. Um, but something occurred to me today that I'm almost ashamed to admit. Um, I think some of my irrational hate for the Pontiac Grand Dam comes from sometimes I see one and think, Oh, maybe that would be kind of cool. And then it's like I have to no. slap myself. Then I have to slap myself and take a shower, and and I just think, no, no, it it really isn't. I I know it, it seemed like every person I ever met that drove a Grand Dam was just. Huh, how do I be polite? They no, weren't. The, they, they, they were. They weren't the kind of person that. I really wanted to hang out with. I'll, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, and, and, my and best friend from high school wrecked a Grand Dam and two Grand Prix. He's still my, he was still my best friend in high school. But like, <laughs> these were kind of disposable cars. You, you ain't driving my car. <laughs> um, I mean the, the the four cylinder, yeah, the thirty one hundred V six. Every time, I mean. It, Maybe you'll agree, and maybe some listeners out there will chime in. Is there a worse sounding engine than a 3100 V6? 
Not many. I mean, I can't think of anything that sounds worse than a 3100 V6. I don't know why they sound so terrible. Um, but anytime you get one with a little bit of an, an exhaust leak, it just, I think oh, that's the thing. I think they all had exhaust leaks. I think it, it, it kind of practically came from the factory. It, it kind of makes me a little nauseous just thinking about, okay, okay. That sound. Um, I will say this. Um, so I don't totally get bashed by the grand Am fans out there. Um, those exist like, like this like, generation like, of grand like, Am, like, I don't think they have fans like, Oh, Everybody has fans. I okay. once met I once met a car club calling themselves Stratosphere because they were all about the Dodge Stratus. That's clever. So yeah, I thought it was clever too. And they were actually some pretty cool people. Um, you know, like a like a late like a late 90s Grand Am GT with a five speed. And I, I was always kind of a I fan of the I, I ever saw one of those. You could you could get them. They were rare, but they were out there. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine had one um, before I met him. He came to a senses, got rid of it, and ended up buying a Taurus show, and then he had an SVT Contour, and I think now he's uh, he's driving a bunch of Subaru. So good on you, Greg. I I need to chat with you sometime here. Um, but you know the the late nineties. If I could get one with a five, you know maybe that wouldn't be so bad. But now I'm back to where I want to take a shower. But wouldn't you rather have the Pontiac with the supercharged V6? I wouldn't. Bonneville, I would, you know, I or? would much rather have the Grand Prix. I would much rather have the GT. Once again, a car that I've I've been on the fence about. I would much rather have the Grand Prix GT or the GTP. I thought the Tudor GTPs looked pretty cool with the with the supercharged 3800. They were fast as hell. That engine is bulletproof. I'm definitely not a Pontiac hater by any means. Yeah. I love I love the kind of the early to mid nineties Bonneville, the SSEI supercharged with kind of that bigger, the bigger rounded style. But man, just the, the grand ams have just always rubbed me the wrong way. I, and I, this one is the is that I just noticed, is that mirror duct taped on there? It is, or it's it's somehow attached on there. It is it, it not is. naturally is. attached on there. It it is duct taped on there. It looks yeah. like the hood. It looks like the hood is duct taped on there. Um, the headlight is duct taped. Well, it doesn't look too bad from a uh, from the passenger, passenger side. No, it, no, side. it still looks bad. Look at this hood gap. What's up with the hood gap? That's iffy. Oh, uh, it's got Our a little images. little little dinged up there on the back. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. rough. I yeah, I'm not taking that. Yeah. Can, yeah. 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 We'll, we'll burn that. We'll get rid of it. Get it off the screen there. It's gone. Okay. We'll burn that. Right. Well, Bruce, I got to say, we both picked a Jag. I think that's very appropriate. Inter um, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. I, I, I'm still not sure you should have your Jag for the buy. Um, but I would, I, I totally, I totally want to buy the try dollars. Like, I think I could get that thing going for a year. And I, I don't have a calculator in front of me. I don't know what, you know, the dollar per day cost on 4,800 is, but I don't know. Here's, here's where it gets tough for, for sellers like that. Um, because I, I agree with you, the ad that that's a case where, you know what? I feel really good working with that seller. The ad is well presented. The car is photographed beautifully. And he um, also has an interest in like other interesting cars. So I right. don't feel like this is just like, oh, you know. Yeah. He didn't park it next to a janky PT cruiser right. that looks like a golf ball. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, so I mean that's a case and it's it's difficult for the a seller with a vehicle like that because you're dealing with a higher mile car that doesn't always have the greatest reputation for reliability, even if it's maintained to the hilt there's there's still that stigma that you have to work against that was always one of my um cheap car rules when i would buy uh these cars regularly was okay i can deal with rust i can do body repair mm -hmm. it's it's almost impossible to try to sell around miles i mean i i can i can show people hey this has been rusty I got it taken care of. I got it cleaned up. I was always honest like that with people. You can't sell around mileage. And, you know, I mean, as a result, most of my cars were 150,000 miles or under. Because once you start getting closer to 200, man, it's just a harder, it's just a harder sell to make. Yeah. 
I, that's fair. So a, a little, a little bit of a top tip from a guy who actually hasn't bought a car in three years. That ninety nine Dodge Ram was the last one I bought, which you hated. But also, you had a I, very I, good I April Fool's it. joke this year. Do you want to tell? While we're finishing up here, what your April Fool's joke was? What is, it wasn't an April Fool's joke. I'm totally changing my name to Volkswagen. <laughs> oh, you mean you mean the the um, I'm going to sell my Mustang and buy and, and, and buy that. What was that? A 2006 Toyota Solara convertible. Convertible, yeah. Because I love I love convertibles, and I mean, let's be honest, the Mustang is just old hat. But that Toyota. There was some other, it was the Solar convertible. And then you kept joking. And I forget what the other one was. It wasn't a uh, Malibu max. It was, Oh, do you remember what it was? I, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Um, but I laughed the because Solar convertible was the first one. And then you double down on something. I, I laughed because I once drove and was very close to buying a Malibu max SS. Oh yeah. I've seen those. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, you know what? It was kind of like the the lift back of the time. It was practical. It was fast. That might not have been an April Fool's joke, but yes, no, I, I, I'm not trading out the Mustang for a Toyota Solara convertible. Okay. Well, I thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so John Clore is going to be with us next yes. week. So if you have Mustang questions, send them in, please, because he will happily answer them. I have not met John personally. I've only known him by reputation, but apparently he's quite the talker. And so if you have a Mustang question, it sounds like he would be happy to answer it. Yeah, um, I, I had the pleasure of working with, uh, with John. Uh, he was actually kind of my mentor that got me into – writing and journalism and uh, the automotive side of marketing. And he's been a friend ever since. And he's probably one of the best Mustang um, knowledge banks you're ever going to find. He owns a Mustang too. You have to be in love with Mustangs to own a Mustang too. He actually got me to love Mustang twos. He talks regularly at Mustang events where I'm, beyond excited to have him on the podcast here um it's going to be if, if you love mustangs this is going to be one that you want to hear if you hate mustangs this is still going to be one you want to hear because few people can tell stories like clore so we're happy to have them that's going to happen next week for uh for mustang day next day or next week very cool so yeah so otherwise um as usual good afternoon good evening and good night whenever you happen to be listening to this podcast we thank you for joining us if you're one of our new listeners from last week who found the podcast somehow and want to keep on listening we we thank you for joining us um follow uh that's the new word for it but follow, follow like you know it's give free. Us a review yeah you can follow I us don't for know free. why. Apparently, people think subscribe means paying money. I don't understand why. So they're telling us to say follow now. So you can follow us for free. YouTube, exactly. Spotify, Apple, um, right at motorone.com. Yeah. Whatever it is. So, yeah. So, but thank you very much. Um, so, good evening. And we thank you for being with us. Bye bye. Yep.